So that's basically it. So I'm gonna welcome people to the show, and we're just gonna talk. Let's just have a fantastic uh, conversation. Yeah, we're just gonna talk. So we got you know, I'm live now. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We're hey, gonna have, we're gonna have a great show. We got two two cameras going on and all kinds of stuff. So we're gonna have a great show with um, Senator Jamila Nasheed, and I'm gonna share how and why God told me to invite her. So I believe that this is the beginning of God doing something really great, starting with the seed of this broadcast. So we're gonna wait for the music to come on. So you'll hear a little bit silence, then I'll welcome everybody, I'll introduce our Senator, and we'll have a great conversation. So in the meantime, y'all share, tell people, to watch the broadcast, okay? So we'll this, be coming on in just a little bit. This is an exclusive. This is an exclusive. An exclusive. <laughs> this is an exclusive. And for those that are familiar with our broadcast, we are usually only on 30 minutes, but we are extending the broadcast wow. today since we have a very special guest. We're giving her a complete hour um, to just talk and to share about your life and about your journey and all of that stuff that makes you you, so. I'm honored. Yeah, so it's gonna Inspire be Overflow. Inspired Overflow. I love it. Yes. All right, so it's there music coming on and you can't hear my intro because you want to be cute. <laughs> Welcome to the Inspired Overflow Radio Show. I am your host, Casey Starlong, and guess what? I'm so glad that God has led you to tune in to another week of Inspired Overflow. Now, if this is your first time ever joining us here, I want to welcome you. Here at Inspired Overflow, we are more than just a radio show. We are a ministry designed to point the way up to Jesus Christ. And so the way how we do that is we invite different people to just come on and share their stories of faith. And every now and again, God might put, put something on my heart to share and release, or we might invite a pastor to come in and teach, or we might even invite people who are called to the marketplace, that God has given them an anointing to use their gifts outside of the four walls of the church. And they come on and share how God is using them and their gifts. But whatever it is, this is just a platform for us to glorify and just love on the Lord. That's what we do here on Inspired Overflow. So I want to welcome you. We have a great guest. Today is actually going to be a one-hour broadcast because our guest is so phenomenal. And the Lord told me to do this. The Lord told me to invite her and have her come on the show. And so y'all know. This is a show that's led by the Holy Spirit, so we're going to do what God says to do. So before I get to our guest, there are a couple of things that I want to make sure that you know about. I'm so grateful for our church sponsors. Now, Inspired Overflow, because we are a ministry, we can't do this without the support of businesses and churches that walk alongside of us. And so I'm so grateful for Haven House City of Refuge. They are our sponsor for the month. And uh, Haven House City of Refuge, their pastor is Michael Folks and First Lady Phyllis Folks. So we give a shout out to them. They are hosting a Friday night prayer service on Friday, June the 29th at 7 p.m. It's going to be located at Haven House City of Refuge Church at 87 86 North Broadway. So come on out for fire and for prayer. Also, on Saturday, June the 30th, the I Am Apostolic Ministry, which is led by Apostle Robert Flowers, he is hosting a free evangelism workshop class. It's going to be called Descending Upon Our City Like a Mighty Army. So we know evangelism is important in reaching and telling people about the Lord. That's on June the 30th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Rock Road Branch Library. And then that Sunday, July the 1st, they're going to be having a special service featuring the guest speaker, which is Prophet 
Bobby Edwards. And again, that's at Center of Hope Church that Sunday, July the 1st at 2 o'clock. And their church is located inside of the Hilton Garden Inn Hotel at 4450 Evans Place. So we thank God for Haven House City of Refuge. We thank God for Apostle Flowers and the I Am Apostolic Ministry for just supporting us. And hey, that's what we want to do here at Inspired Overflow. So if you got upcoming events, we want to help you get the word out. So it's all about promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ and pointing the way up to the Lord. So let's get into our topic for today. I saw my guest. I saw her like taking a breath. She's a friend, y'all. She's a friend. And um, like I said, the Lord put her on my heart. And so without further ado, I just want to welcome to Inspired Overflow for the first time, Senator Jamila Nashi. Welcome. Thank you, Casey, for giving me the opportunity to be on Inspire Overflow. Yeah. you know, uh, This is a, ma a magnificent opportunity for me to be able to let people know who I am. Many of uh, the people that are listening uh, on the uh, Facebook Live, a lot of them know me, but many of them don't. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. And so for those of you that may be listening through the live stream or maybe you're actually listening through the radio, um, you can watch this interview live on Facebook. You can watch it through my page, Casey Starlong, or you can actually watch it through Jamila Nasheed's page. We're both live streaming. So shout out to everybody that's watching through technology yeah, and amazing. they're able to see you live in Lemon Color. So, you know, Jamila, I mentioned um, that this is your first time ever to the Inspired Overflow radio show. So those of of, um, those people that may not be familiar um, with you, I already mentioned that you're a senator, but <laughs> just a little people, the people, just a little bit of background about your um, title and your current position in the state of Missouri. Well, right now I serve uh, as a senator for the fifth senatorial district in the city of St. Louis, uh, which covers approximately half of the city from north all the way to the river. And I am one that uh, create laws mm -hmm. and laws that impact the quality of life for uh, the people that I represent and even people throughout uh, the state of Missouri. Yeah. So um, for those of you that may be new to the Inspired Overflow Ministry, and I've shared this um, with our regular listeners, that before I got called to preach, um, I was actually a politician. And so that's how uh, Jamila and I knew each other. So Jamila was in Jefferson City. and. I was in St. Louis, and you know we developed a friendship. Well, you have to go back be before that. Okay. Yeah, because I mean I, I met Casey when um, she ran for office uh, the first time ever, and her her grandfather was my mentor, and it was a uh, senator, former senator uh, Jet Banks, and John Bass. John Bass. I'm sorry, John Bass, and and um, Jet Banks was my mentor as well, though, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, Casey and I, you know, we met by way of her grandfather. What he told me uh, on, on his deathbed that my, my granddaughter's running and I would love for you to support her. And I told him that I would do everything possible to help her get elected. Yes. And she won the race. We won. We won. Not just because I was there, but she won because she put a lot of work in. But you know what? You were really helpful and really instrumental because when I first ran for office, and this was back in 2007, you know, a lot of times people are kind of afraid to support somebody new. They're like, oh, where did you come from? But, you know, you you had been elected. You were a state rep at the time. And you were like, hey, I'll endorse you. And you helped me knock on doors. And, you know, I appreciated that because that gave me some legitimacy as a new candidate to have a state rep vouch for me um, and vouch for my campaign. So thank you. It was, it was great. Yeah. You did a fantastic job, by the way representing the sixth award. Yeah, it was fun. And, um, you know, it was fun to work with you on some things as well. And so really outside of politics, we had a friendship. Absolutely. You know, and um, I will say that um, even leaving politics, there are a few people that I really still talk to and that I would consider friends, but I consider you to be a friend. Oh. Yes, I do. She just warmed my heart. We may not talk all the time. And I think, like, our upbringing and our lives are completely different in some ways. Right. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about your life because I think that that is really, um, it's kind of funny, Jamila, because when I first got this show, I was like, I'm not having any politicians on this show. <laughs> this is just going to be straight ministry. Sure. Um, but I saw a video. There's this pastor. His name is Steve Furtick. He's in North Carolina, I believe. Kind of a young white guy. He's kind of hip. Preach, preaches the word of God. Um, a, a massive following, a big church. Um, and he did a video where he interviews Charlemagne the God. Are you familiar with this guy named Charlemagne the God? 
No, I've never heard of him. Okay, so he um, is on The Breakfast Club. Okay. Which is a syndicated, you know, kind of hip-hop thing or whatever. So Steve Furtick, this white guy from, you know, rural America, he interviews Charlemagne the God, who is, like, from New York or lives in New York. But come to find out, they have, like, the same background. But anyway, um, Charlemagne has different religious views than Steve Furtick. But Steve Furtick says, you know what, we just need to have a conversation and come together. And I really feel like God was like, he put you on my heart to bring you in and just to have a conversation. That, you know, there may be some things that we may not see eye to eye on, even politically or just in life, but to come together and just have a conversation um, because there are some commonalities. And I think both of us can look back and at our lives and see and see God. Oh, absolutely. And so that that's what we want to talk about today. That's great. You know, and I, and I truly uh, believe, uh, just like you, that at the end of the day, uh, we so often look for uh, things that we don't find in common. But there are so many things that we can all agree on, uh, be it whatever religion. We can always agree that there's a higher being that we have to live up to that standards. So, and here, you know, um, one of the things that I've just come to find out um, is that, you know, just how good God is and, you know, just how he is present even in the highs and, and lows of life. And um, being your friend over these years, um, one of the things that I've always been just like really fascinated with your story, you know, like I heard like bits and pieces just through conversations with you. But, you know, recently we had the time to just kind of sit down and you were able to just kind of share your story. And I really feel like people need to just hear your story and just see God through every step. So if you don't mind. So you want them to see deep inside of me. I want them to see. I want them Not to see. just the surface. You know what? <laughs> One of the things that I've learned, and you know, I tell, I talk about this a lot. One of the things I've learned, titles are great. You know, it, it's great to be elected official. We give honor to elected officials. You know, I commend you for what you're doing in the state. You're standing up, you're speaking up for people. You know, you have such passion, you lead with integrity. You know, you are an advocate for people. That's awesome. But that kind of stuff will fade away. That's right. You know, I want to talk about what makes you on the inside. That's what I want to talk about. Well, let's talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so let's start off with um, October the 17th, 1972. Twins are born to Agnes Williams and Jerome Gaines. Those twins are you, Jerome, and Janice. Those twins are your brother and you, Janice Williams. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, as many may know, I grew up with my grandmother. My mother uh, committed suicide at the tender age of 25 and my father came home uh, from the Vietnam War. I mean, he literally escaped the Vietnam War to have been shot by way of a drive-by shooting uh, in um, Pirago. And so gun violence, you know, kind of rippled, mm -hmm. you know, my life yeah. uh, throughout the years and, and everything. And I grew up with my grandmother, my, th my three siblings, which uh, brought all boys, uh, Jason, Nathan, and at that time was Jerome. And uh, I can tell you, we were not all good, okay? We, we had to live in the projects with my grandmother, uh, impoverished, mm -hmm. massive poverty. I was angry, bitter with society, mad because I had to live in those conditions, angry because I didn't have a mother and a father. I mean, I don't know if you will ever, ever understand it, but uh, victim, I mean, survivors, uh, parents who committed suicide, Oh, they have so many, many issues internally. And today, I still deal with those issues, you know, of uh, rejection, uh, denial. And so, you know, my grandmother, she, she kind of set the tone for us, though. She always loved us. She always believed in, you know, our abilities to succeed. Even though I was that rebellion kid, mm -hmm. I still had a certain love for my grandmother. I would always get in trouble, always get in trouble. And I... Uh, my grandmother would cry. Mm -hmm. There would be days, 13, 12 years old, I would stay out. Two and three days, my grandmother not knowing where I was, but afraid to call the police because uh, she feared that they would take me from her. Mm -hmm. And so she would just be there crying. 
not knowing if I'm okay or not. And I, and I put so much on her. But I can tell you this here, my grandmother died uh, two years ago, and she was able to see the transformation that God had, you know, placed in my life. You know, I want to just back backpedal a little bit because I know you say it, and it comes out almost effortlessly. Your mom committed suicide in her 20s. And so you have grown up not knowing who your mom was, and then your dad was killed in a drive-by sho shooting. So you you have no recollection of your parents. And that was a tough, that was very tough for me. I mean, imagine a child, you know, growing up without a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the two people that are supposed to protect you and, and, and shield you from harm. Mm -hmm. And to not have had that uh, was, um, and it still is to this day, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I can I can I can imagine, you know, just talking to you and what that what that may feel like. But you know, one of the things that I've come to understand, and I'm going to weave in some scripture in here, because the Bible talks about that, you know, God is a mother to the motherless, and He is a father to the fatherless. You know, it's nothing like having, you know, that biological parent there. But God says, look, I step in. You know, the word of God talks about that good and perfect religion is taking care of the orphans. He cares about, you know, kids that don't have a parent. And so God allowed your grandmother to show love um, in the place of, of your mom and, and your and your dad. So let's talk about the teenage Janice, because that's your biological name. That's Janice. right. Janice. When you hear that it's name. It's pretty. It is pretty. When you, hear, when you hear that name, Janice, what do you think? The first thing, you know, that, you know, that I'm thinking right now is like, why did she name me that? I mean, what was so significant about Janice that she felt uh, to, to give me that name? And so I would never know that. However, I think it's a pretty name. I yeah. thought she did a well job. I mean, yeah. outstanding job naming me Janice. Yeah. Uh, but during my teenage years, that's what you want to talk about, huh? Teenager years was um, was very rough for me. You know, again, I was rebellion. I, I didn't believe in God. I was I felt that if there was a God, then why am I am I in these conditions? If there was a God, then why are we waiting on a, a once a month check and then after the check is gone, you know, we're struggling, you know, to eat. But my grandmother, you know, she never really. Um, I didn't know that we were impoverished. Because we were always that family that, you know, prayed together and we sat around the table, we ate together, and um, she made it work. But I was still angry. And so I took my anger out on society. I was bitter. I was a vicious little kid, like a kid you would not even want to com come across at that time. And so a juvenile delinquent, in and out of uh, the juvenile justice center. They threatened her again. They said, "Listen, if she doesn't get it together, mm -hmm. you know, you are going to, uh, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have to lose her." Uh, it was a situation where there were an organization called the Tahi Youth Group, and they would come to the projects. Mm -hmm. And every Wednesday, they would come down to the projects, and we would be like out of control, smoking weed, drinking beer. I mean, we were year, real young too, you know. Uh, really with no guidance, you know, no no one there to really inspire us to be the best because all we had around us was our heroin addicts and, and drug dealers. And we would literally see dead bodies. Well, we would, have, we would hear a gunshot and we would run towards the bodies just to see if it was someone we knew. And we never had counseling for that. Mm -hmm. You know, that like now when you see a mass shooting, you have those individuals, they get counseling automatically right away. We never had any of that. So I don't know how that even impact me to this day. Right. You know, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, is that, you know, you mentioned that, you know, you you were like, there is no God. You know, that you're impoverished, your your parents aren't here, you know, um, how has how how has how has your how have your views changed? You know, because I know like you've seen a lot, you know, what is your vision of God? Who is God to you? Oh, God is magnificent. You know, God is all merciful, most compassionate, you know, uh, most forgiving. You know, God is all of that to me because, again, at the end of the day, I don't believe that I would be here if it, if it wasn't but for mm -hmm. God, you know, taking me from that dark side and showing me the light. 
and it was through a hair round addict guy. Um, he was a hair round addict. He br brought a little pamphlet to me, and he said, read this book. And it was like, who made you? Where is the nearest place you can meet him in the heart? Mm -hmm. And it was like God, and then Allah, and, and everything. And so I was intrigued by that. And I can tell you to this day, I know that nothing happens without the will of God. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you that are just now listening, we are having a candid conversation with Jamila Nasheed. And she's this is just really her just sharing her story. And, you know, Jamila, I mentioned early on that, you know, um, I got this idea that the Lord placed this in my heart to do this kind of interview after watching um, Pastor Stephen Furtick have this conversation with Charlemagne the God. So you have this Christian pastor from rural Missouri and he interviews, you know, this hip hop, you know, DJ who is Muslim, you know, he's he's kind of, you know, spiritual. And, um, you know, the, the context comes from a book in the Bible, John chapter four, where Jesus meets a woman at the well. And this was a woman that uh, people like Jesus didn't normally interact with, but Jesus has a conversation with her. And I really believe like this is a time for us to just kind of sit at the table and just have a conversation and let God have his way. Yeah, he's working through you. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah, he's working. He's working. And I believe that, you know, this broadcast is just planting seeds. Yeah. It's just planting seeds. So, you know, we talked about angry Jamila as a teenager. I want to talk about um, because what I've heard is, is that you got your GED. So tell us about... Um, dropping out of school or being let go, pushed out, pushed out. Tell us pushed about out. tell us about being pushed out of school. Well, you know, uh, still as a teenager, I was um, not focused at all, and I would leave uh, Roosevelt after lunch and go to a bookstore called Progressive Emporium, and I was intrigued by what was happening inside that bookstore more so than I was intrigued about what was happening in the classroom. And so I would do that every single day for over a month. I would leave there and go to the bookstore. Uh, and I went one day to school, and the counselor told me that there's no way you can catch up. You're too far behind. And uh, I was pushed out of the system. And uh, no, one, no one came back to retrieve me. I was still a juvenile, OK? Uh, there was no truancy officer that knocked on my door. but. I felt that the bookstore was changing me in a manner in which I didn't think I was getting inside the school. I mean, I, I started believing in myself, believing that there was a higher being and a higher purpose. You know, I learned about pride. I learned about our race and, and its culture. You know, I learned so much in that bookstore. I mean, from Marcus Garvey to Harriet Tubman to Sojourner Troop, Booker T. Washington, all of those individuals that had struggles far greater than my struggle would ever be. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to be able to learn from, from those individuals uh, took me to another level. It took you to another level. So, you know, you, you mentioned that you got pushed out, that, you know, you, you, you dropped out of high school or got pushed out. Um, and you mentioned that no one came to see about you. I know earlier that you talked about with the death of your mom and, and your dad that feelings of abandonment and rejection come in. Um, do you feel like that that was another way of society just kind of rejecting you, that nobody cared that you weren't still in school? You know, just if I'm looking at it now, you know, back then that wasn't my thought pro process, okay? But just looking back, you know, I can see that. Mm -hmm. I can see the correlation between what I was feeling with the loss of my parents and the fact that no one reached out, yeah. you know. You know, one of the things I want to talk about too, uh, Jamila, because on that date, October 17th, 1972, there were two children born to your parents. It was you and your ten bro t twin brother, Jerome. Um, and, and your twin brother, he didn't necessarily start off on the same track as you, but something happened where he ended up um, in, a, in a severe place. Tell us about that. Yeah, so during his teens, he was a really quiet young man. Teen, should I say. And he would always be up under my grandmother. And I was that bad kid. I was never in the house. And I used to bully him a lot, you know. You little cry baby, you always up under grandma, you know, and whatnot. And uh, he would suck his thumb and play with his ear or whatnot. And 
years, two or three years had passed, and he came outside and had never been in trouble a day in his life. And he wound up getting caught up with some guys that was much older than himself. Mm -hmm. And they committed a crime, and he was a part of the conspiracy to the crime. Mm -hmm and he was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. He had never got in trouble in his life. I mean, it wasn't like this guy was a part of a revolving door in and out of the criminal justice system. It was just one mistake that cost him his life. And he's been there now for approximately 30 years. And it was just by the grace of God, like you said, you know, God take care of those orphans, right? Uh, last year, there was a case um, that came up in the Supreme Court uh, it was um, Alabama, I'll get the case. Mm -hmm. It was um, Alabama versus, I'll get it. But at any rate, they ruled that a child, a teenager who commits a crime during the teens cannot be sentenced to, to life without the possibility of parole. Yeah. And it's just by the grace of God he's coming home next yeah. year. So your brother is coming home. Yeah. Your twin brother. Alabama versus, Miller versus Alabama. Okay, Miller versus Alabama. So God has allowed this overturning. Um, it really is an overturning of lives. Oh, absolutely. Because, I mean, he had exhausted all of his appeals. There was no way out. Mm -hmm. And just by the grace of God, boom. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you back out to the world. And, and hopefully, I mean, he's a sharp guy. Uh, he, he, he knows three, four different languages. Um, he, he learned a lot during the time he's been there, and he's and he he never I, he, he's going to be a great guy out here because he doesn't look for no one to feel sorry for him. Yeah, I mean he very seldom called me, you know, or asked me for money, you know. I mean he's a he's a he's a sharp, genuine, genuine young man. What are your what are your hopes and dreams for your twin brother upon his release? Because he's getting out this year or next year. Next year. Okay. What's your what's your what's your dream for your twin brother? I want him to be an example uh, coming out here of what not to do and who who not to be involved with. And just to, you know, just to, to try to live and not, you know, try to live the past. Mm -hmm. And tr don't try to go back and say, oh, I missed this, I missed that. But just move forward. Mm -hmm. know, and, and, and know that whatever God for you have for you that no one can take from you. Yeah. And that God already know where he's going to land you. And so I just want for him to be able to be an example, you know, to be a good husband. Uh, he's married now uh, to a, a beautiful young lady. She's a nurse. And I just want him to be an example. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, one of the things, so speaking of an example, uh, you, to me, and I told you this, I think probably one of the greatest things that you could have ever done, and this still blows my mind. I, you've done a, a lot of great things legislatively, but... You took in a relative at the age of three years old, and you've raised this child. So you have not had any biological children of your own, but you took in a relative, and you've raised this little girl who's now a young lady. I want you to tell us about this decision to take upon your cousin and raise her. I'll say this here. You have to be um, a person that truly understands that at some point you have to break cycles. You know, and I can tell you, Nigel, mother, she's my first cousin. She was 15 when she had her. She knew nothing about parental in, uh, involvement with the child. Her mother, which was my mother's sister, her aunt, she was a heroin addict for 20 something years. So her mom came home uh, addicted. Mm -hmm. And so she really didn't know how to raise a child to no fault of her own, mm -hmm. you know. And everything and so she shook the kid one time and um, I thought that was uh, disturbing to me so I told her that I'll, I'll take Nigel and I'll raise her and you know you have to you have to really really uh, understand that when you don't want the cycle to continue you have to step up and be that it takes a village and so Nigel she's she's gonna be 19 tomorrow uh, she graduated from school uh, last year. She's, she's, she's getting back on track. I, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't easy now. Yeah. I mean, she gave me, I, I can curse on here, but that girl gave me a hard time, yeah. you know. I mean, it was like a roller coaster ride. I mean, I cried many of days. 
that girl gave me a hard time. And I don't know if it was because, you know, she felt a sense of abandonment. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, imagine having a mother in the world and you cannot be connected with them, or you're not with them. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a, hurt, a hurt, hurting feeling as well. And so I, I, I didn't get a book on how to raise a kid. You know, I just had to do the best that I can. And, and I, I, think I, I think I did that. I think, you, I think you've done well. Because, like you said, uh, Najwa has broken the curse. Right. That you weren't able to get like a high school diploma, but Najwa's mother wasn't. But Najwa has a high school diploma, and she is on the track for a career. Yeah. And she's got a pharmaceutical tech right now. Yeah. yeah. And what I what I find amazing is is that you could have looked at this baby being shaken and, and thinking like, you know what, this isn't good, but. I don't know how to be a mama. Right, she ain't mine. Right, she ain't mine. <laughs> so that's somebody else's problem. But the spirit of God on the inside of you, had there was compassion there for this baby. And I know what it's like to be in politics, but really for you being a state rep and a state senator, you're spending the majority of your time in Jefferson City. And so to take upon a child and to raise a child, that's a sacrifice. And um, that's nothing but the Lord that gave you the grace to do it when you wanted to give up, when you wanted to throw in the towel, you wanted to say, look, this is too hard. Look, you go, you go here. But that was the grace of God that wouldn't allow you to do that. And let me tell you, there were many a days I wanted to do that. Many of days. That girl gave me a hard time, especially in the teens. And girls come in, I mean, you know, they change in the, the peer pressure. And, you know, I mean, it was just really, really bad during those teen years. And, but I told myself that I was never going to just give up on her, yeah. you know. My grandmother didn't give up on me, you know, and she could have given up on me many a times. But it was just that type of uh, spirit that my grandmother instilled in me that I, I knew at that point I would have to just hold on to this girl's hand and lead her the way. And you know what reminds me is that I know that you said kind of off the record that your grandma was a praying grandma and that you know All she would time. take y'all to church and that's the spirit of God that says look and because that's what that's what God has done with us through Jesus he's like I'm not letting you go I love you so much I'm not going to let you go and so your grandmother did that for you and you have done that for Najwa and you can imagine that Najwa is going to do that for somebody else and that, that's a new cycle um, that God is adding to your family line, which I think is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's good. So let's talk a little bit about you becoming a bookstore owner because I find, when it, I find this pretty amazing that you dropped out of school or was let go of school, but somehow, some way, you end up opening a very successful black bookstore. Tell us how that happened. You know, you have to have a lot of uh, self-confidence, a lot of belief that, no, you have to not. You have to be fearless too, okay. because it's, it's 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 hard making tough decisions, and especially as a teen, you know. And so I went to a friend of mine, you know, and I told you I used to hang out at the bookstore. I mean, the bookstore. I did a, I did the one eighty there, and I'm like, if if books can change my life, mm -hmm. what can it do for all of those individuals who have gone astray? And so I um, I used to go to the mosque every Friday. I wasn't a Muslim at the time, but I was still seeking. God. And I would still read the Bible. So I was reading the Quran and the Bible at the same time. And so I, a friend of mine came and he's, I told him I wanted to open up a bookstore. And he was like, well, you can, you can open up a bookstore right across the street here. And it was on Grand and, and uh, Cousins. Open up the bookstore, 300, 200 square foot of space. Call the guy uh, in Baltimore uh, who owned uh, a distributing company. I received his information from a Progressive Emporium bookstore. I used to hang out. I went on and I went on the back of the books uh -huh. and I was looking, you know, just seeking, or, you know, like I was trying to figure out where he was getting his books from. And I found a bookstore in Baltimore, and it was a um, a bookstore that I knew nothing about. But I made the call and I told the man that I wanted to come there. So I had a friend that worked at the airport. And I got a dummy pass, I mean, a buddy, a buddy pass. And when I got the buddy pass, she said, listen, you may be stranded for two or three days, you know, because it's a standby, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, okay. I went to the, uh, I went to Baltimore, Afro World. His name was Nati. And he was just amazed that you had this 19-year-old kid 
yeah, and never traveled before to you know be in Baltimore, right? You were fearless. <laughs> and so you know, and so I, I said, listen, you know, I want to be able to buy two thousand dollars worth of books, and if you can give me, uh, 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 if you can match that, then I would greatly appreciate it. And he did just that. And after uh, months and a year passed, I figured I wasn't going to be able su to sustain the bookstore, uh, just uh, hoping people come in. Mm -hmm. I would have to take it to the road. And so I would go into Ebony Magazine and look at all of the conferences, uh, black engineers, you know, black attorneys, conferences about everything, and they just had a list. And I would try to get the ones that were close to me, and I, I took the show on the road. Wow. And when I took the show on the road, it was really successful. You know, I was at a lot of conferences. I did a lot of traveling. That's amazing. A girl from Doris Webby um, Projects, raised by your grandma, pushed out of school, but she got a traveling bookstore and a physical location for a bookstore. Yeah, and, and, and so I was able to expand the bookstore to from, from moving from uh, close to 600 square foot of space to a beautiful 1,400 square foot of space on Natural Bridge and uh, Kings near Natural Bridge and Kings Highway. And it was more than just a bookstore, it was like a community center mm -hmm. where we would do everything in that bookstore, have uh, debates, arguments, we would do head wrapping sessions. Deneen Busby had her had her uh, book club there, and I had so many authors to come in and out of St. Louis. But what was most important to me, and what really gave me comfort uh, doing that job, because I did it from nine to nine. Mm -hmm. Ten, yeah, I did it from nine to nine uh, for ten years. What gave me comfort was when individuals uh, came home from prison, and they said, "If it wasn't for you, uh, sending me books." I don't know how I would have made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So books have had a, a major impact on your life, and really, you know, again, that is God that is giving you an entrepreneurial anointing to open up a bookstore. Like I hope you see, like just the His handprint all over your life. That's a grace. That's there are not many nineteen-year-olds that just say, "Oh, you know, I want to have a bookstore." and you go fly somewhere and somebody helps you, gives you a line of credit to help open up your business. I mean, that's just that's just God. And that's just God. And God has clearly been with you. Yeah. He's still drawing you closer and closer to him to have a relationship with him. Oh, absolutely. That's what he's doing in your life even right now as you sit here on the Inspired Over Floor radio show. You have no idea what God is going to do in your life. You guys, I just really feel the spirit of the Lord and God is speaking to me and I really believe that God is, he's moving upon the hearts of our elected officials, of our leaders in the St. Louis region. God is doing something amazing. And I just wanna challenge you, especially to believers, don't look at things with your natural eyes. Ask God to give you revelation. Ask God to give you eyesight to see what he is doing in our city through his perspective. He's touching hearts. He's reaching people, unlikely people, to do amazing things. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to hear more from Senator Jamila Nashi. We've been hearing about her childhood. Now we're going to hear a little bit about how she made the entrance into um, her career in politics. So don't go away too far. We'll be right back. Yes, that's good. I'm enjoying myself. You're enjoying yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I got a little emotional. I know. I know. Uh, and I almost started crying on your show, you know. I, because, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I get emotional when yeah, I talk about things okay. like that. You know? Yeah. So. There's a lot to get emotional about. Yeah. You've been through a lot. Yeah, and you know, but, you know, God uh, God is going to always be there for those that truly believe in Him. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I'm going to tell you, He told His or orphans that He would put a shield over them mm -hmm. where no one can penetrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that yeah. uh, that's been working for me. God cares. Like, what do you have to say? I know you've been what sitting do I here. Have I know to you say? got a lot to say. Man, that was a fantastic uh, interview, and we ran in the same places. I used to hang out at Progressive Emporium. Is that right? And I've been in your bookstore. Yeah. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, who was the owner um, of Progressive Johnson. 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 As a matter of fact, we have a part two of a progressive uh -huh. right there on uh, Sarah. Okay, you guys, sorry. We're going to cut okay. this part short. But um, your song is on. Um, but we are going to to go back live, okay? Because I want to get as much talk time. I got a couple of uh, announcements that I need to make, but we'll jump right into it.
All right, and welcome back to the Inspired Overflow Radio Show. I'm your host, Casey Starlong, and we've been having a dynamic conversation with Senator Jamila Nasheed. She's been she's just been talking, just sharing her life story, and I've just been amazed at how God's handiwork and footprint and handprint has been all over her life. And so we're going to get back to her in just a moment. There are a couple of announcements that I want to make sure that you know about. First Lady Beverly Kendall, she's going to be um, our she's going to be one of our guests later on this month. She's hosting Women of Worth. Uh, their annual women's conference is taking place June 28th and 29th. Now, the 28th and the 29th, she's having a seminar section at seminar session at 6:30 p.m. at their church at Higher Heights Deliverance, which is located at 2127 California Avenue. So that's that 28th and the 29th. Then on the 30th, she's having an all-day conference. I'm telling you, it's going to be awesome. I've been going for the past five years. And so each year I go, I'm always amazed. I'm actually going to be one of the speakers on the 30th, so I'm excited about that too. But just food, fellowship, empowerment, it's going to be amazing. It's only $35. It's taking place at the Holiday Inn Hotel, the airport location. I want to encourage you to get your tickets by calling 314-852-5586. Now, also, the Father Support Center of St. Louis, they are hosting um, a, a, a new kind of a kind of a new program. It's called Parenting in Partnership, and it takes place Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 1 o'clock at the Prince Hall Family Support Center, which is located at 4411 North Newstead. And now, this Parenting in Partnership class. They are talking about employment readiness skills training, parenting skills training, healthy relationship skills training, financial literacy, legal information, and there's even a $50 incentive to participate. So if you want to enroll, if you want more information, call Miss Stringfellow at 314-333-4170. And we just thank God for our Father Support Center for what they're doing in the lives of not just fathers, but also mothers as well. And so that's a great segue into our conversations, uh, State Senator Jamila Nasheed, because you have a connection to Father Support. You're going to be doing something really amazing with them. Tell us about that. Well, tonight they're having their graduation, and I will be the keynote speaker at Harrisville State University. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So we salute the graduates. Oh, absolutely. Be, uh, yeah. Taking place in that program. We salute the great work that's taking place in Father Support Center. And what are you going to say tonight to the graduates? I'm going to inspire uh, those men uh, who, who are graduating uh, to be the best fathers that they can possibly be. Yes. That they have had their roadblocks and they've overcome obstacles. And now it's time to just re enter into the lives of their children and make those children's lives much better than that it was before. Yeah, you know what? I just really have a heart for men, and I'm praying that God's going to open up a door one day where I will be able to just talk to fathers, um, because I wish that there were some things that I could tell my dad now. I wish there were some conversations that I could have with him. Now that I'm saved and like I know Jesus and got a relationship with him, there are just some conversations I wish I could have with my dad. So yeah, I miss him too. Yeah, you knew my dad. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You knew my dad, and so, um, but those those are some those are some of the things you know. And I'm sure you might be thinking about just some of the conversations you missed having with your dad, um, who you didn't get a chance to have a relationship with on this side of the earth. Um, But all is well. God still uses you to be able to speak and to speak into the lives of these men. And so I know you're going to do a great job tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking about your life, uh, Senator Nasheed, all the way up until your decision to run for office. And so um, you are currently in your second term as state senator. Correct. You're in your second term. What made you even want to run for office? I didn't really want to run for office. (laughs) You know, at that time, I was uh, really anti, you know, politicians and politics. I, only, I thought that politicians only came around when they wanted their vote. And so I was really, really like hard on politicians because I was an activist. And a lot of activists don't really connect like that with mm-hmm. politicians or whatnot. And so a friend of mine, uh, she uh, decided that she was going to run for office, uh, Yafat Elamine. Shout out to Yafat. Shout out to Yafat. Yes. And she, uh, she, she ran for office, and I was a part of her campaign. It was fun. And I knew that she was going to go there and do uh, the right thing for the people. 
And I think that was one motivating factor. Mm -hmm. And then there was another time where someone came to me, because, you know, I was an activist first. Yeah. You know, shutting down highways and things of that sort. Yeah, there's this great picture of you being, like, carried off. Like, somebody, See, like the police have each limb, yeah. one arm, and legs. Yeah, and, yeah. See, yeah. I was an activist before it came popular. It became popular, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, we were fighting for minority inclusion. Yes. Uh, with the Metrolink expansion and Highway 70, your, your granddad was went to jail. Your dad, granddad went to jail, or whatnot. And so, they said it's time for you to go on the inside. You've been out on the outside. You've been fighting on the outside for a long time. It's time for you to go on the inside. I don't want to do that. I kept saying, No, I don't want to do that. Let me just be a politician maker. Yeah. They were like, No, you going in. So I have a question because, you know, you came in through the vein of an activist and we're seeing a lot more activists run for office. And so you're kind of like a trailblazer in that area. Did you ever, have you ever, have you ever, I'm giving you time to, to, uh, to brace yourself. <laughs> have you ever felt like, man, I sold out or I'm selling out? Have you ever like come across that? I don't feel that way okay. because... My activism is now making laws yes. that impact the quality of life uh, for the people that individuals on the outside are mm -hmm. fighting for. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's inseparable. You have to have, you can't have one without the other. You need those individuals that's going to sh shake the tree, and you need those individuals that's going to pick up the apple and feed the people. So you say that and you're so, doing both. Yeah, actually, I, I, I'm still protesting. I was just protesting last week, you know, and so I may be protesting again this week uh, due to a uh, lack of minority inclusion on the uh, Ball Park Village phase two. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where we're going to go with that. Uh, I'm looking into it. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that, you know, activism, is, it's inside of me, yeah. you know, to be a voice for the voiceless. And I'm going to always be a voice for the voiceless. And sometimes people may not agree uh, on my tactics and how I approach trying to help those that are in need and those that cannot fight for themselves. But at the end of the day, husband and wife doesn't always agree. Yeah. You know, um, it's so funny because... I knew of you before I knew you. And I would say, like, my nature is probably a little bit more reserved, just a, just kind of a little bit more... Diplomatic. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, 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 huh? yeah. You know, just yeah. more kind of even, you know? just. Uh, <laughs> and I would be like, man, she's so brash. Yeah. She's so brash. Oh, my gosh. Like, why is she saying it like that? Yeah. But I've come to understand. You know, there was a disciple like that, mm -hmm. um, one of Jesus' disciples, and his name was Peter. And Peter was known to be brash. But there was a point um, in Peter's life where Jesus says, you know, Peter, you are the rock. You know, you know, Peter had the revelation of who Jesus was. But anyway, I just say all of that to say is that you need people with all kinds of different right. personalities in your circle. And, um, you know, God wires us in different ways. You know, and he's wired you in this way to be effective with what he's called you to do. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. You know, I'm... I'm what they used to call the diamond in the rough. Yeah. You know, now, yeah. now I'm that beautiful diamond that that's shining right in your eyes. Yep. You know. Yep. 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 If know, I must say so myself. Right. You know, uh, Jamila, <laughs> she's so humble, y'all. <laughs> she said, you know, that fearlessness, that brashness. Yeah. She's she's so humble. You know, um, what what are what are what are some things that you've learned over um, the course of these two years? Because your grandma passed away. And then your mentor, your best friend, Eric Vickers, recently passed away. You know, what do you think God is trying to get you to learn through through these recent deaths? You know, to show people that you love them, why, why they're here. And to be a little bit more, um, I would say, sensitive to others and to just love life and live it, mm -hmm. you know, to, to its fullest mm -hmm. without doing it in a self-destructive manner, okay? Uh, my grandmother was everything to me, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I knew that your grandma raised you, but yeah. I think it wasn't until I saw your expression and your grief on Facebook that I didn't really realize the impact you know, that she had on your life and the pictures that you took of her and how you spent time with her uh, she was passing away. What would you say to your grandmother? I'll say, woman, quit eating that pork. What are you doing over there <laughs> eating pork? <laughs> so, so, you know, I call her every day, you know. I would call her every day and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
put in that part. That's your way of saying, Grandma, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She would tell me, uh, you don't tell me what to do. Uh, you need to quit acting like a little kid all the time. You know, now you got more sense than you. Like she was, I, yeah. I played with her so much. I used yeah. to play with her so much. And yeah. she used to like, I used to get on, get on her nerves, you know, but I just loved her, you know. I just wanted her to be happy. And she had the opportunity to see the transformation. Mm -hmm. And that's what's like really, 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 really um, gives me that, that, that happiness inside. That, I mean, it was many days like with Nahajwa, I cried, she cried with me, about me. Mm -hmm. And so for her to be able to see the transformation was phenomenal. And she lived a long life, you know, 32 years. Yeah. And uh, she, her birthday's coming up July 18th, it'll be the third year. That's I don't go to, yeah, I don't go to the grave sites. I mean, I just mm -hmm. want to just, don't want to be bothered with it, you know. Yeah. But I, I, I agree, I'm still grieving. Mm -hmm. I still grieve. I, I, sometimes I just break down and cry. Yeah. And, um, yeah, that's gonna happen, and it's natural, and it's okay, even as a state senator. Oh, I cry a lot. Yeah, nobody yeah. knows it, but I cry a lot. That's, that's okay, and it's healthy to cry. Um, you know, one of the things that I had found, Jamila, is that when my dad passed away unexpectedly, um, that his death actually is what led me to have a relationship with the Lord. Wow. You know that I was going to church, and you knew me back then, and you know I went to church and stuff, but it wasn't until the untimely death of my dad that I really knew to, to, to grow to, to know the Lord. And so I just want to encourage you with that, that sometimes God will use death to lead us closer to him because those people that we may have ran to for support and for love and, and for compassion, right, for Eric and advice, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so God is, he's a jealous God. He's a loving God, but he's a jealous God. And he's like, I want your attention. I want you to run to me. And so sometimes God will allow that to happen. So I just encourage you to just allow God to have his way in your life. And, you know, sometimes I still, I think about Eric a lot, you know, because Eric was a guy very intelligent, mm -hmm. okay, methodical uh, in, in how he moved. And he taught me so much. I mean, sometimes, like, he believed in me even when I didn't believe in myself, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, he's going to be missed. Sometimes I hear his laughter because he was just like a goofy dude. Yeah. He just laughed about any and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could be like in this heated debate or whatnot, and he would just start laughing. Or we can be like, something's like really bad is happening, and he just start laughing. And he never took anything, uh, he was a light guy. He, I mean, never, he never took anything heavy. Mm -hmm. He prayed five times a day, every single day. And um, we strategized a lot, we argued a lot, and uh, we, we, we helped each other grow. And it was a good thing, and, and he's I mean, he's gonna be truly missed. I mean, that, that was my when you say a sage, that's my sage. Yeah, it's my brother. Well, everybody knew that you had a great relationship with your with Eric. You know, um, you guys were together a lot, and you know he was a friend and he was a mentor to many people. Oh, absolutely. You know, Eric did some work on my first campaign, some ghost writing. Excellent <laughs> writer. He's an excellent, excellent, excellent writer. Excellent yeah. writer. Excellent speaker. Um, excellent strategist. You know, um, our time is coming to a close. Um, and because you are a state senator, um, the Word of God talks about that uh, God doesn't allow people to enter into, you know, elected officials unless he puts them there um, into positions of um, political authority. You know, that everybody that's in political authority, um, it is because God has allowed that to happen. So whether you like them, whether you disagree with them or whatever, you know, the Bible and Romans talks about that, that, you know, those who are in positions of leadership and authority, they're there because God's hand has placed him there. What are your hopes? What are your dreams? What's your vision? Uh, what are your prayers for the St. Louis region? Right now, what we see, uh, and I see it, I say it all the time, is right now we have the tales of two cities, and sometimes that may seem, sound like a cliche, but it's real. You know, on one side of, uh, uh, Del Mar, south of Del Mar, you have uh, massive development, from, you know, all throughout the south uh, of Del Mar. And north is just, um, all you see is hopelessness and decay. And so, you know, my prayer is for God to instill in me uh, the strength and, and the vision to be uh, that one that changed the dynamics of how St. Louis looked when it comes to 
the murder rate and the low the low education mm -hmm. uh, rate of, of poor black mm -hmm. kids. I mean, you have children that cannot grad I mean, that's graduating and not knowing how to read and write on the third grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a unemployment rate uh, among black men to the tune of uh, twenty percent. And so we want to be able to just look at all of the ills that's plaguing uh, the city when it comes to uh, the polarization and and the, 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 the lack of job opportunities, education, and, and, and just, I just want people to start having pride because we have lost pride in ourselves. We've lost pride in our community, in our neighborhoods. We lost pride in our city. I want to be that person to bring that pride back, and I want to be able to have God hands all in it, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that, that he's going to use me for that. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah, this was good. This a little was emotional, good. but fun. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay to, to be emotional. Well, I, I wasn't trying to cry up in here, you know what I mean? I cry on here a lot, so yeah. it's all good. Um, well, we thank you, Senator Jamila Nasheed, for joining us here on the Inspired Overflow Radio Show. We really thank you for doing that. We're going to be praying for yeah. you, continuing to, to pray for you. Yeah. Um, and also, for those of you that are tuning in to the Inspired Overflow Radio Show, maybe you're listening or maybe you're watching, um, just let us remember to cover our elected officials. I believe that God is doing something upon their hearts and he's drawing people. Yeah. The word of God talks about that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Um, sometimes people don't yet know. They don't have the revelation yet to, to humble themselves or, or to seek God. But those of us that are believers, we can pray, we can intercede, and we can stand in the gap. And I believe that there are many of us that have been doing that. Many before I even came on the scene have been standing in and interceding for our city and praying for our leaders. And um, so God is moving. God is moving. God is moving. And if I can say this, you know, if any children, are li if they're listening, uh, they, they should take from this, uh, this session that I was once a kid breaking laws. Uh, and I wasn't supposed to make it according to statistics. And now I'm a woman making laws. And so God, you know, God can put people in places to really give you that hope and that inspiration you need to be who you should be. Uh, and that's God conscious, along with just loving your people and being a voice for the voiceless. Yeah. You know, don't count anybody out. Because when God's hand is upon that's right. you, his hand is upon you. That's right. And so my prayer for you, State Senator Jamila Nasheed, is that you will lead with wisdom that you will lead with love, that God will heal. We all need healing, that God will heal. Yeah, I need healing, yes. That God, that God will heal, and that he is going to complete the work that he has started in your life, even those prayers that your grandmother prayed over you that you have no idea, the prayers that she prayed over you and your twin brother. God heard them. Yeah. He never forgot them, and he's going to fulfill them. He's Thank you. Fulfill them. So you guys, I pray that you've been blessed by today's show. This has truly been a blessing um, to have State Senator Jamila Nasheed <laughs> on the Inspired Overflow Radio Show. This has been fun. What I want you to do is tune in, same time, same place. Next week, we're going to be here for more of Inspired Overflow. I pray that you've been blessed by this broadcast. Do me a favor, share it. Tell people about it, spread it, let people hear it so that they can hear the story of what God is doing in the life of this state senator. She was once breaking laws, but now she's making laws. Only God can allow something like that to happen. I want you to stay rooted in the things of God. Stay rooted in God. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, ask God to come into your heart. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you do that, then you will be saved. Get into a good Bible-based church. I'm praying for you. My life has been changed by the power of Jesus Christ. It was nothing else but the Lord. I'm here to stand and tell you that my life has been changed because of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. All right, you guys. We'll be back next week. Peace out. Girl, you good. <laughs>